welcome to our discussion on statistical methods and data analysis. Today we're going to discuss some definitions and determine why we would use statistics and what statistics is. The first question we need to ask is what is statistics? Well statistics is actually used in everyday life. You see it used in sports with things such as batting averages, free throw uh, percentages, etc. It's in economics, consumer spending indexes, things of that nature. Gallup polls. One big one would be uh, presidential election polls. And then quality and productivity of improvement in businesses. So maybe we'd like to determine if, for instance, we are drink manufacturing company, is our machinery filling the drinks to the specified amount? Now, statistics is a process of making decisions when we're confronted with uncertainty, and it can be used to aid in scientific inquiry. It's used in training programs. Perhaps we have a new training method, and we'd like to see if it performs better than the original training method. Monitoring advertising claims plant breeding, genetics, and even things like building beams. When a new building is put up, do the beams meet certain specifications? And statistics can be used to determine if this is the case. Now our process is a scientific method. The first thing we need to look at, we need to form our hypothesis. This is something we'd like to be able to prove or disprove. We need to determine the importance of our hypothesis. We need to design our experimental study. We need to come up with a decision rule for this experimental study. Then we can go out and collect our data and analyze. Once we've done this, we can apply our decision rule, and we make our conclusion based on that decision rule. Sometimes it's necessary that we reformulate our, our hypothesis and start all over again. So there are two types of statistics that occur post-data collection. The first is, is a descriptive statistic, and these can be used to summarize and describe prominent features through graphical and numerical analysis. These are important. These will involve things like summary statistics and graphs. Our second type of statistic is called an inferential statistic, and we utilize this to evaluate our information present in our data in order to make our decision and conclusions. In other words, we're able to make a statement based off of the results of our decision and conclusion. There are three types of decisions we can make. The first type is estimation. So I wonder what the value of uh, the mean age of students at a particular university. And we wonder what the value of this, this mean age might be. Well, we need to estimate that. Our hypothesis tests. So here I wonder if the value of that mean age is some specified value. In other words, we have an original value in mind. And then prediction. I wonder what a future value of this mean age might be. Our population. This is the set of measurements that corresponds to the entire collection of units about which information is sought. And this value is usually unknown. Now, when we think of population, we generally think of a large, very large value. And if we were to shrink our population to a very small set of individuals, perhaps just the population of an entire class of students, well, that population value may be known. However, as we increase the size of our population, that value becomes harder and harder to be known. So we typically say that our population value is unknown. And this is why we would take what's known as a sample. This is the subset of measurements that are actually collected during the course of the investigation. And this value is known because we can set this value. Perhaps we're looking at, again, the mean age of all college students at a particular university. And so we take a sample of, say, 500 students and we collect their ages. Now we know the sample value, whereas we may not know the population value. So here's a general idea of what we mean. 
if we consider this large circle, our population, we can see that the items that are circled in red are just our subset, our sample of our population. Our parameter, well, this does go with the population. It's a numerical descriptive measure for a population. However, because our population value is unknown, our parameter value is also unknown. And then we have a statistic. This is our numerical descriptive measure for our sample. We know the value of the sample, therefore we can calculate the value of the statistic. Now our parameter is going to be denoted with Greek letters. Mu will be our population mean. It's unknown. Sigma squared is our population variance. It's unknown. Sigma is our population standard deviation, and it's unknown. Rho is our population correlation, and it's unknown. Pi is our population proportion, and it's unknown. Eta is our population median, and it's unknown. Now, a quick note here, pi is sometimes written as p. Our statistics, however, notice these are all in regular English letters. X bar, that's our sample mean, and it's known. And this represents our population mean mu. S squared, that's our sample variance, and it's known. It represents our population variance. S is our sample standard deviation, and it's known. It represents our population standard deviation. R is our sample correlation. It's known, and it represents our population correlation. P hat, that's our sample proportion, and it's known. It represents our population proportion. And then M is our sample median, and it's known. It represents our population median. So, why do we obtain a statistic? Well, we obtain a statistic that we calculate from the sample in order to make a decision regarding a parameter about the population. In other words, we collect a statistic so that we can then make some type of a decision regarding our unknown parameter. Now, there are several ways that we can actually obtain this statistic. One method is a case control study. A second method is an observational study. And then a third method would be an experimental design. Now, our case control study. This consists of few objects of interest. And there is no generalization that can be made to the public. As an example, suppose I have two groups of subjects, one with a disease and one without. And I collect information from their past regarding disease risk factors. And I then draw conclusions about the group with these characteristics. Our observational study. This consists of many objects of interest. It measures very few attributes. There is possible generalization to the population. However, with an observational study, it's much harder to generalize to the population because there's no intervention by the researcher. It's simply, as the name suggests, the researcher observes. Therefore, no cause and effect can be made. All that can be shown is an association. Our observational studies, they lack the ability to so show causation because of what are called lurking variables. These are something we're not measuring, but it's causing our result observed. An example of lurking variables would be, does using a cell phone lead to brain tumors? And so we could look at people who use cell phones and determine if they develop brain tumors. There is a problem. What about those who are genetically predisposed to cancer? So here we can only show an association between cell phone usage and brain tumors. Now, these observational studies lead to what's called bias where we systematically favor one or more groups or individuals over another. And there are several types of bias that come out of this. One type of bias is called selection bias. So suppose we selected graduate students who were in 500 and 600 level statistics classes and tried to use their opinions to determine opinions about all students. Well, this is problematic because what of those students who are not statistics majors who may not like statistics at all. Graduate level statistics students that may very well love statistics, whereas other students may not. Response bias. This type of bias leads you to respond a certain way. One of my favorite questions 
is, have you ever committed a criminal act in which you caused bodily harm to another individual? This was, this was a question posed by one of the professors I work with. The problem is that as soon as you throw in the word criminal act, fewer people are willing to respond yes. Even though many people have siblings, and many of those siblings fight. And so they have committed bodily harm to another individual, but they're not willing to respond because of the word criminal act. And then there's the non-response bias, failure to respond. A very good example of this I've posed to my classes, which is, have you ever taken the Taco Bell survey? You would drive through Taco Bell to do the drive through you get your receipt, and they'd say on the back of it is a survey where you have a chance to win a thousand dollars. And many people simply throw this away. They didn't respond. Now, our experimental study, on the other hand, we have many objects of interest. We measure few attributes. However, generalization to the population is possible because we impose an intervention, a treatment by our researchers. We can use this to show cause and effect. There are ethical issues which may be present with our experimental study, such as suppose that we have created a new type of parachute cord, and we want to test this to see if it's as strong as a standard parachute cord. Well, it's definitely um, unethical to take two people up in a plane 12,000 feet one with our new cord and one with the standard cord and push them out of the plane and say, good luck. And so other types of methods would be used to try to evaluate the strength of this cord. Our experimental study allows for the ability to show causation due to an applied treatment and the effects this treatment has caused. An example of this might be, does running in place incre increase pulse rate? And so we would take a resting pulse rate, and our treatment we would apply was, would be to have people run in place for 30 seconds. And at the end of 30 seconds, we would retake a pulse rates. Now, this is a very, very simple example. However, we have applied a treatment. We've had, the, we've had the individuals run in place for 30 seconds. A good experimental design uses what's known as replication, where the experimental condition is repeated across many experimental units so we can see our pattern develop. Well, what is an experimental unit? This is what the, what the treatment is being applied to. A good experimental design also allows us to, the ability to impose a treatment, the ability to control external factors, and have a control group as a reference treatment. Now, these control groups include non-treatment, such as uh, perhaps we're going to design an experiment where we want to see if different fertilizer percentages of nitrogen help in the growth of corn. And in one row, we may not put any fertilizer at all. Or a placebo. Placebos are seen in things like medical studies where perhaps one pill looks identical to all the others, but there is no treatment in there. There is no active ingredient. It is simply a sugar pill. Now, our experimental unit, we discussed this a few minutes ago. This is the object to which our treatment is applied. Our observational unit, this is the object which is measured. So in the case of our corn growth, it might be the total yield in tons for the season. Our experimental error, this describes variation among identically and independently treated experimental units. One thing we need to be aware, of, be aware of is what's called pseudo-replication. So perhaps we are looking at determining how a certain type of food impacts fish growth. Well, in this case, we have all our fish in our tank. However, these are not independent because our experimental units are tank, but our observational unit is our fish. So a better method would be to have each fish in its own individual tank. Therefore, our experimental unit and our observational unit are the same. Now, one thing that we do like to do, random assignment to treatment groups. This avoids bias. This also avoids lurking variables. Also, random sampling from the population is necessary. 
Each object in the population needs to be equally likely to end up in the sample. This allows results to be generalizable to the public. And at the end of this video, I will show an example in R. Our randomization can be done in several ways. One type of way, we could simply draw names from a hat. But if we have a large sample, that would be rather cumbersome. We could use a random number generating table, but again, if we have a large number of samples, that's rather cumbersome. We could use a computer, and this is a little less cumbersome. Now this randomization can then be used to show causation. Okay, so how might we do a random sample in R? Well, let's take a look. Okay, so what I'm going to do is just generate some data. A very simple example. And perhaps I'll generate 100 numbers. So x is going to be, I'll go from 1 to 100. And there we have our x values. Now perhaps I would like to take just a random sample of, say, 15 numbers. And so I would simply type in sample x, and I want to get my 15. And there we can see. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 numbers. And these correspond to the individuals out of this 100 who would be selected. So individual 89, 75, 48, 64, 94, 37, 18, 72, 15, 1, 88, 11, 25, 21, and 100. Okay, that's it for this introductory video. In the next video, we will start talking about collecting sample statistics. See you then.